Hello everyone, Baron Schwartz here. Just waiting for just a moment for everyone to come online. All right, I'm gonna go ahead uh, since we're two minutes into the hour and I'll be with you for 45 minutes or an hour or so um, You know, I have 45 minutes of material plenty of time for questions So let's go ahead and get started with some logistics and so forth as I said, my name is Baron Schwartz Here's my email address and uh, Twitter handle and feel free to contact me uh, I always enjoy hearing from people um, you can also tweet questions at any time to Vivid Cortex during this broadcast. I'm watching a live stream of a Twitter search for that. It seems to work a lot better than using YouTube comments or the like. And we will, we're, we're recording this and it's going to be uh, posted as a video on YouTube afterwards and we'll also post slides on SlideShare and um, a follow-up blog post with any questions and so forth as well as links to that from Vivid Cortex's blog. So for anybody who misses it, you can tell them what they missed and make them sad and send them to, this, uh, to the Vivid Cortex blog so that they can get unsad. So today we're going to be talking about how MySQL uses indexes to make queries go faster, and in some cases a lot faster. Um, so let's begin with the basics of what an index is. And I'll be drawing a lot of pictures. I'll also be showing a lot of pictures from Flickr throughout this uh, presentation. I'll be trying to demonstrate all of this visually. I found that that's a much better way for people to learn how indexes work and how to exploit them. So the most basic thing, an index is called an index because um, it was actually designed following the same principles as an index in a book. And if you think about an index in a book, it contains a list of terms. And the terms are sorted so that you can find them easily. Um, and usually, in a lot of uh, indexes, you'll actually have page headers that'll help you to skip through pages. Um, and that concept also shows up in indexes. And then underneath each section um, or term in the, in the index in a book, it'll have page numbers. And you can flip to that page and find what you're interested in. Well, an index in a relational database, particularly MySQL, what we'll be talking about today, works very much the same way. An index is a structure for quickly looking up some data of interest and finding out where in the table or collection of data it might be located. And you can answer a lot of questions with indexes, such as whether or not that data exists at all. Um, and as we'll see later, you can even get the data from the index without having to go to the table. So indexes might be built on top of the table, or they might be uh, stored separately from the table. And we'll see examples of both. And there's a variety of types of indexes. Uh, the most common that most people use, most um, relational databases use, is the B-tree index. But MySQL has supported multiple storage engines since the, practically the beginning of time. And um, along with that, each storage engine implements particular different indexes. So you'll see hash indexes on the memory um, storage engine, log structured merge indexes, or a variation of that, fractal tree indexes in TokuDB, and probably in some upcoming uh, MySQL storage engines. And then there's a bunch of others. Um, MySQL's built-in engines like MyISAM and InnoDB support full text and spatial indexes. Um, MemSqueak will support skip, index, skip list indexes. And there's lots of others. Um, there are lots of third-party storage engines that support uh, columnar storage and um, Patricia trees and so forth. Lots and lots of different kinds of indexes. The table is a set of rows, as you know, um, and they may be stored in any order. And I've uh, got a random collection of numbers in this table. And it's unsorted. So I've, I've got a four column table, and then next to it, I have a two column index. And this index, you'll notice, has as many rows as the table. 
And that's something that I didn't figure out for a long time. <laughs> I don't know what, it, I, I can't really remember what I thought indexes were before I suddenly realized that there was a row in the index for every row in the table. Um, in this sense, an index in uh, MySQL storage engine is not like an index in a book because typically you won't have one word in the index of a book for every word in the page of the, of the books. But that's the way that storage engines use indexes in MySQL. There's one row in the index for one row in the, um, in the table itself. And the index's data is the key. So in this case, columns B and D are the key that we can use to look up into this index. And the index is sorted. And if you look, column B starts at 16, ends up at 97. Column D looks like it's in relatively random order. But if you look about a third of the way down, you'll notice that column B has two rows with the value of 46 in it. And within those two rows, column D is also sorted from 37 to 43 in ascending order. So the index is going to be uh, sorted. It can be one or multiple columns. And if it's multiple columns, each of those um, columns is sorted in order within the, the primary sort order defined by the columns that come before it. And I'm really showing you a particular kind of an index here. Um, hash indexes I won't cover very much. Um, they don't work quite the same way. Uh, but for most purposes, you can think of an index as being a sorted collection of pointers into the rows in the, in the table itself. Now, indexes are usually built with a data structure. And typically, it's a tree structure, most commonly a B tree. A B tree is a um, hierarchical organization where high up in the hierarchy, you have a root node. And then each of the, um, uh, each of the items in that root node points to a collection of items in a child node. And this can go on for multiple levels. I'm only showing one level here. But it can go on for multiple levels. And eventually, you reach the leaf nodes where the data itself is actually stored. And then those leaf nodes uh, point to the rows back in the, the main table. Now, this is a little bit technology specific. For example, in my ISEM, those leaf nodes are going to have um, offsets in the main data file because the main data file in, in uh, my ISEM table is just a sequential collection of rows. In NODB, it's a little bit different story, and we'll come to that later. So the purpose of an index is to be able to very quickly traverse this structure, whatever the structure or algorithm is uh, that constitutes the index, and find rows. And in some cases, depending on the structure and the algorithm, find ranges of rows very quickly. So you're trying to reduce the cost of accessing these rows. And this much is probably familiar to everybody. So let's look at a few kinds of indexes. B trees, what we'll be spending most of our time today talking about. B-tree is multi-purpose. Um, it's easily the most popular index data structure for MySQL and for most relational databases. It's the default for SQL Server, for Oracle, for pretty much every um, database technology that you can think of. And the characteristics of a B-tree is that leaf rows are sorted, or leaf, um, row, uh, leaf nodes contain rows in sorted order. And it supports looking up a single row, finding out whether it exists or not, and finding out where to look for that row in the table. It also supports looking up ranges of rows, so an in inequality condition, like rows between values 5 and 10. And it supports scanning in order in a range of rows, um, including scanning the whole index in order from beginning to end, or some subset, such as greater than 5 or between 5 and 10. And in most cases, um, indexes are actually doubly linked so that you can sort um, in one direction, but you can traverse in both directions. So you can scan backwards. You can scan backwards from the, the range from 10 to 5, for example. A hash index is a way to look up exactly one row at a time. And it's relatively special purpose. It's an, there are lots and lots of databases and types of databases that use hash indexes. And I'm sure as a developer, you use hash indexes all the time in maps or dictionaries or hashes, whatever your programming language of choice calls them. But inside of databases, they're a little bit of a niche purpose. Um, and I certainly use them for things like um, web session data and, and the like. 
But in many cases, those kinds of accesses are better off left to something else like Memcached or Redis anyway. A hash index only supports looking up a single row, and it doesn't order the rows because hashing is essentially a randomization uh, strategy. And you take the key, you hash it, that gives you a location. You go look there, you see if the row is there. And since the um, hash of the key is randomized, there's no ordering. And that means that you can't look at ranges of rows at a time. You can't access groups of rows, bulk um, access, and you can't scan rows in order. So you can only do one at a time lookups with hash indexes. There's a newer type of index. Uh, B-trees have been around for decades and decades. And this new type of index called a log structured merge tree has only been around for um, 15 years or so at this point. And there's a variety of implementations of it. It is not essentially a single canonical implementation like a B tree is. Uh, there's pretty much like a reference B tree implementation. Uh, it's the kind of thing you would do in a computer science course in college. And um, you would not build a B tree very differently from the way that anyone else builds it in most cases. But log structured merge trees are actually quite different. They consist of an entire family of related data structures and related algorithms to access those data structures. But in general, um, the principle is that data is written in an immutable fashion and then never updated after it's written. If you change some data, what you do is you write a newer record to the end of an active segment of data. And when that segment fills up, it becomes inactive and is read only after that point. And then eventually older levels, uh, older segments of data are merged together into lower and lower levels that are typically larger and larger. And so you get a lot of the uh, characteristics of a tree, but there's a lot of other things, many, many subtle things about uh, log structured merged trees that make them much more complex than B trees. And that might make you ask, well, why would you care about log structured merged trees? Uh, and that's because they have some nice characteristics that come along with that complexity. In particular, B trees, because they update data in place. Uh, they require reading data before you write it. And that read represents random IO, and uh, there's all kinds of things that can happen. You're page splitting and page merging, and there's just tremendous amounts of complexity and locking and concurrency control around all of that. And it ends up having a lot of overhead. And even worse, it ends up being much faster in memory than it is when it's on disk. And log structure, structured merge trees avoid this catastrophic drop off of performance when the working set of memory gets larger than uh, the working set of data gets larger than memory and has to spill onto disk. So if you look at, for example, Percona's benchmarks of NODB versus uh, TokuDB, you will see that the, the NODB has a very sharp cliff where write performance drops sharply. And TokuDB's write performance just keeps going pretty, pretty flat and steady for a very long time. And I wrote an article about this in the latest um, DZone Analyst Guide, the DZone Guide to Database and Persistence Management. I wrote a little bit about it there. And there's lots of other interesting uh, references that I give in there for further reading on that. So there's a few goals of indexing. In general, the goals of indexing are to find the data that you're interested in fast so that your queries can execute fast. But there are three primary ways that we can do that. One is by reading less data. Another is by reading data in bulk or contiguous chunks of data. And a third one is to exploit the inherent ordering of the index itself. The data is ordered in that index. So we can use that to optimize queries further. There's a variety of different ways to think about this. I'll give you some references at the end. Um, for example, there's a book called Relational Databases and the Optimizers. Um, they phrase it in slightly different terms. Uh, there's some good presentations from the folks at Toku Tech. Uh, they use also slightly different terms, but we're essentially all talking about the same three goals. Less data, read the data more efficiently, and exploit the ordering. So let's look at these goals one at a time. Number one is to read as little data as possible. So here's our table again. And there's a query, select column C from the table where B is greater than 70. If we have no index, then we have no choice other than to start at the beginning and scan through every row and apply that where filter. Is B greater than 70? If so, we care about this row. If not, we eliminate it. But as marked by the, the pink color uh, in the row backgrounds, we have to touch every single row to answer that question. So that's a full table scan. 
And that's about as bad as it gets for a simple query that doesn't have any joins or anything like that. Um, so let's see how we can optimize this with indexes. So same query, but now we're going to read from the index on the right. We'll start at row 77 because the index's data structure allows us to seek directly to that point. And then we can scan forward from there where B is greater than 70. Um, and what we do is we scan forward to the end of the table um, because everything up to infinity is greater than 70. So we're just going to keep scanning until we hit the end of the file. And so we touch every row in the index for there. And then for every row that we're interested in, we make an access to the main data file and look up the row in the main table that we were interested in. So this is kind of how an index access in my eyes him would look. You would scan through and make um, a, an access to somewhere in that main table, the colored rows, to look up the rest of the row that you were interested in. Now, as you can notice, the, the access to the index is ordered. We're scanning sequentially. And all of the rows there are clustered together and packed nicely. But that's not the case in the main table, where we're making essentially random accesses into it. And since that data was generated randomly, it's, it truly is in random order. Um, so what we're going to do in the main table is make a bunch of single row point lookups. And there are lots and lots of ways to optimize these kinds of things. Um, decades of relational database research has gone into this. And there are many well-known strategies, um, such as uh, um, doing bulk accesses, you know, collecting. Instead of doing uh, one at a time row lookups, you can collect a bunch of row pointers. And then when you get enough of them, you can go read a chunk of them all together that are sequentially close together and so forth. We won't get into that because that's really getting into the guts of the database. And that's not as much of a concern for us as here as just noticing that we're making random access and that the rows that we're accessing are kind of sparsely scattered throughout that table. So goal number one, again, reading less data. And if we change our query, instead of selecting column C, we can select column D. Now, if you notice, column D is included in the index. And so we can start, we can seek to the, the entry point of that range in the index, and then scan forward from there. And then the index itself contains column D. So we don't need to access the main table at all. We can just read from the index. And this is called a covering index, or we can say that the index covers the query. Um, there are various terms for this as well. Index only query, for example, is how they call it in Postgres. Uh, but the idea is the same. You're, you're reading less data, and you're not doing any random lookups into the main table. And let me go back for just a second. A couple of things here. Um, we're not only making uh, fewer IO accesses or, or logical accesses to this data, but we're accessing fewer columns. So that's another important aspect of this. Uh, don't touch columns that you don't need. And there are fewer columns in the index than there are in the, in the table itself. So reading in bulk, that's another important thing. If the data is, that you want is packed closely together, as it was in that picture that we were just looking at, then you can read ranges and chunks of data at a time instead of doing one by one scattered reads. Um, and and we're, we've moved on to goal number two, by the way. Um, so reading in bulk is goal number two of using indexes. Um, being able to read data that's packed together means that you can get a lot more interesting data with each um, I.O. operation or in each chunk of memory that you're looking at. For example, each page of memory is going to be much more densely packed with data that you're interested in. And this makes a big difference. Um, so you're, it's kind of another way of reading less data if the data is packed together. It means that you're not reading data that you don't want. Secondly, sequential access is much more efficient than random access. And this is true of uh, certainly of uh, spindle-based hard drives, but it's also true of solid state drives to some extent. It's also true of memory. Um, you know, it's, it's true gen universally that reading data that's packed closely together and reading it sequentially is more efficient in general. Um, it's also true that solid state drives are much faster than spindle-based drives at random access. Uh, but there's still a difference between sequential and random access, even in SSDs. So to read in bulk, one of the things that we can do is use a clustered index. So we're going to throw away and discard that index um, at the right. 
and we're going to cluster by sorting our main table along the two columns that were in that index, columns B and D. And the, the data is now reordered here. If you want to scan your eyes down through, you can see that it matches the, the same order in those two columns, B and D. And a clustered index basically means that the table and the index are the same thing. And if you dig into the internals of any relational database or storage engine, you will find that whatever the term is, whether it's index or a relation or so forth, you'll find that indexes and tables are really conceptually the same thing. And it's just that the index is used as a lookup table into the main table, so to speak. Um, but if you sort the main table and then build the index structure, that B-tree structure on top of it, which I'm not showing here, uh, just to save space, then you can get the same benefits of an index combined with the row storage itself. So in this case, we would have all of those same internal um, non-leaf nodes with the index um, nodes in them, eventually pointing down to the leaf nodes, which would contain not only the keys of uh, column B and D, but also the extra columns A and C in the, the leaf node storage. And InnoDB supports this. In fact, InnoDB only supports this. Um, some storage engines, like in SQL Server, for example, you can, um, you can index, index organize your table uh, to cluster it, or you can just let it be the default, which is um, heap storage. Uh, but InnoDB doesn't allow you that flexibility. InnoDB and in MySQL always stores every table in a clustered index. And if you don't specify a primary key for it to cluster on, then it will create a hidden internal primary key, which is an auto-increment integer. It's a six-byte counter. If you do specify a unique index or a primary key, InnoDB will use that instead. TokuDB supports what they call multiple clustered indexes. Um, but it's, it's a little bit different than multiple clustered indexes, because what TokuDB will do if you tell it to cluster on multiple indexes is really create multiple indexes that have, at the leaf node, all of the columns in the table. So it's sort of like that index that's X'd out on the right, except that we would append onto the leaf nodes the columns A and C that are missing from that. Um, that may be a little bit confusing. You can look through the TokoDB documentation for that. It's a nice feature, and it works pretty well in TokoDB, primarily because of uh, well, they're efficient indexes, for one thing. But another thing is that TokoDB has compression built in natively, and it works really well. It's got very high compression. So if you have cheap indexes, and uh, compressed storage like TokuDB gives you, you can create lots of fat indexes with lots of columns in them um, with less cost than you might be expecting. And this is, uh, this is uh, of, of interest to you, by the way. I'm not particularly trying to advocate for TokuDB or anything, just, just mentioning it. So now we can read in bulk. Uh, we can do those same two queries, and we can do them from the table itself rather than from the index. We've still, you know, we've thrown away that index that's X'd out on the right. And we can do that by, here I'm showing the, the tree structure that's built above the, um, ab above the table in the index's uh, data structure. We can do that by finding the beginning of that range of rows and scanning through it. In both cases, we have B greater than 70, and we're scanning through it, and we can read the columns that we want directly from that table um, in order of B sorted. So that makes, um, that makes both of these queries um, tightly clustered together in terms of where the rows are located, as well as reading columns uh, without having to do a lookup into another structure. Goal number three of using indexes is to exploit the ordering characteristics of the indexes. And we've seen this a whole bunch. You know, in fact, these, these three goals, um, <laughs> you really can't talk about them in isolation of one another. They all relate to each other pretty tightly. Uh, but the third, the third thing that we want to do is exploit the fact that those rows are ordered to avoid doing extra work um, to make the index do the work for us so that we don't have to do work with the rows after we retrieve them. And this makes a lot of single pass online algorithms, such as counting and doing averages and um, summing things up and standard deviation, all of those kinds of things, makes all of those things possible in one pass. Um, what you do is essentially you create a cursor into the table or, or into the index, and you scan forward, and um, you're looking for some criterion. Um, when you find the matching rows, the beginning of one set of matching rows, then you can just stream the rows from there. 
and no post-processing is necessary depending on the query. So obviously an order by query, if the order by matches the index uh, sorting order, then you don't have to post sort the rows at all. If you did have to post sort the rows, you would have to do what MySQL calls a file sort, um, or potentially using temporary tables for, for some types of queries. And uh, avoiding that is a big efficiency. It avoids a lot of collecting things together into buffers, maybe writing the buffers out to disk, sorting them all, merging them afterwards, and then maybe even doing a lookup to find the rest of the data from the merged rows. It's, it's a tremendous optimization. So order by is um, public enemy number one that indexes can help eliminate. Group by is similar. So if you're grouping by something that matches the way that the order of the index is sorted and matches the index in columns, for example, if we were grouping by column B, what we would do is we would seek into the beginning of our range and then scan along um, and keep track of which column we're currently looking at. And every time we look at the next row, if that value, value of the group by column changes, then we have just finished looking at a group of rows. And within that group, we can do things like summing things up and so forth, as I mentioned. Um, and then we can emit one row for that group and then start accumulating um, a new row for the next group, uh, scan through the next group. When that value changes again, emit another row. And so it's a tremendous optimization for a lot of group by queries. And the same thing for distinct. For example, if we wanted to just get the distinct values of B out of, an in, uh, out of a table that it was indexed on B, we could just scan through the index and um, look only at when that value for B changes. So lots and lots of uh, different types of queries can be optimized this way. And it gets a little bit difficult to explain those things with SQL um, examples in a short webinar like this. So I won't show uh, deep code samples of that kind of thing, um, but just mentioning here that that's one of the goals of indexing. So with that in mind, those three goals of indexing, we need another numbered list. We need six rules for getting the most from your indexes. And these are the six most common things that are either things you ought to be doing or things that I've seen people trip up on and uh, suffer bad consequences from as a result. So let's look at those in, in order. The first thing is to make sure that your query's expressions can actually be used as keys into the index. Um, the technical term for this is a SARG, or search argument. And what you want to do is make sure that you're expressing a constant value or a range that is defined by constants on either end that can be used to seek down the data structure and seek along and compare against the values in the indexes. So you want, uh, you want to be able to compare values against values. Um, and to do that, one of the most important things to do is to make sure that you don't compute functions on the items in the where clause. What you want to do is compute functions that turn into constants that the query execution engine can then take and push down into its search through the index. So a uh, a good pattern is to compare the column D to a date range. You know, it's, it's uh, older than 30 days ago. A common bad practice that I see is to add D and 30 days ago and uh, subtract, the, you know, compare that to be less than now. And what you've done is you've created essentially a function around this column D. Now, column D's values might vary as we go through the table. They will vary. So that's not a constant that the optimizer can use to search into and seek along that index. So you want to isolate that column D that you plan to use in the index. Um, you want to isolate it on its, on its own with no expressions around it, no you know, to upper or to lower or rounding or anything like that. You want to make sure that it's, in terms of an equation, it would be on one side of the equation all by itself. Number two is to know what the left prefix rule is. And this really applies to B-tree indexes and others that have an inherent search order or sort order in the way that the data is physically laid out, in particular for multi-column indexes. So these multi-column indexes are um, just like you would sort in a spreadsheet, you know, sorted first by column one and then subsorted within that by column two. And you can have lots of columns, of course. And you can also have column expressions in your where clause. So let's look at these um, and how, how they can access that data in the sorted index B, columns B and D in the index. Same, same index that we've been looking at. So the first thing that you can do is you can use a prefix of an index. Um, the key that you, the search argument that you 
use to, uh, or, or that the database uses to look up entries in the index can be applied to all of the columns in the index, the full width of the value, or just to a prefix of it. And if there's a prefix of it, it has to start at the left, because that's where the sorting starts, at the leftmost column. And the index prefix will stop being applicable the first time you have a non-equality comparison. So what you want to do when you're creating indexes is think about the queries that you use, and um, certainly focus on the most important of those, and then create indexes that can have equality matches in your work clauses, beginning at the left, and put the range comparisons, if possible, all the way at the right. Because any columns that are to the right of a range comparison can't be used. So let's look at these queries. I'll, I'll look at the, uh, the salmon colored, um, light red colored query at the top. Select columns B and D, where B is greater than 70 and D is 11. OK, so to, to satisfy that query, we would uh, seek to the beginning of the range B greater than 70. And, um, and then we would scan along until we find a row in the index where D is 11. So there's only one row, that uh, third row in that range, where that is true. So that's optimized because, um, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's not optimized because there might be, um, and I didn't draw this, I, I should have drawn some, uh, actually now that I'm looking at this, I, <laughs> I wish I had made a little bit better example of this. I'll do better next time I give this presentation. I wish that I had made another row with an 11 a little bit further on and illustrated that this query would scan along um, and access a whole bunch of rows in column B, but maybe only look up a couple of rows in column D. OK, so we would be looking up essentially non-contiguous ranges, and we wouldn't be able to use the index to narrow down immediately the exact rows that have column D equal to 11, because it comes after an inequality comparison in the where clause. It comes to the right of the column that has, a, that, has that inequality. And then we can look at select columns B and D from T where D greater than 70. Well, we're missing any criterion on column B at all in this case. And so we're going to have to scan through the whole table because those rows could be anywhere. There's no sorting that clusters them together and allows us to limit the scope of our search to a particular subset of the rows. And then finally, in the blue, select B and D where B is equal to 46 and D is greater than 40. Now, this is the one that's well optimized because um, we can look into those rows and see that there's a range where B is greater than 46. And we know that within 46, within that specific range, there's only one um, or possibly a range of rows where D is greater than 40. So we can seek to the beginning of that range, which in this case is only one row, and then um, and then scan from there until the end of that range, until D um, until we hit the end of the, the range where B is 46. Hope that's clear enough. I got myself a little bit <laughs> twisted around when I realized that I'd messed up the, uh, the example in the orange a little bit. So sometimes you can do tricks to fill in a gap. If you have a gap in an index, um, really common ones that you might use is to convert a range to a list. Um, so if you have, for example, an integer column, and then you have a range of like B between 5 and 10, you know that there's only five potential values in there. So you can create an in list with every possible value. You don't want to do this too much. You don't want to create in lists that are too large, because what MySQL will do is essentially consider each of those as a separate little point query. If you look and explain, it'll actually call, um, it'll say it's using the range access method. But it's really, there are two kinds of range access method in MySQL. One is where it's a true seeking along an entire range. And another is an in list, which is basically a collection of equalities. In this case, it would be a collection of equalities with that in list. Um, and then in some of the other cases, you might have a small set of known values, and you're missing that at all uh, completely, such as, um, on a dating website where people might be looking for um, potential people to get in touch with, and they don't care about the sex. Um, you know, if, you're, if you have an index that has sex uh, and you specify you're looking for males, um, easy. That's something you can index on with inequality. But if somebody doesn't specify, 
then you might have to just create an index, um, an, an in list with every possible value of sex in there, like male, female, and then maybe an empty uh, string for an unknown, um, or what are the other values you might have for there for that, for that column. Now this is actually improved in MySQL 5.6 where index conditions can be pushed down into the index itself. Um, it doesn't mitigate the fact that the index itself still has to go looking through a bunch of rows that might or might not match because they're not sorted contiguously together. But it does mean that at least the storage engine doesn't send those rows back to the server across the, the storage engine API for the server to evaluate those where clauses. So there's a, an optimization there. And the references that I give in this last bullet point, one's a Percona blog post, another one is from the official MySQL manual. So you can look up and see how that works. Another thing is index-only queries, um, three in our list of six. It's hugely beneficial in many cases to create covering in indexes for your most common, most important queries. So as we saw before, and if an index contains all of the columns that you need, then you don't need to actually look in the table itself. Um, and this helps a lot in InnoDB where it access to a secondary index that's followed by an access to the primary key to find the row actually results in two index lookups. Um, the secondary index will give you the primary key columns, and then the storage engine will use the primary key columns to go search for the row in the primary key and in the main table itself. So that's a big efficiency to avoid. Um, you do have to know your servers, you have to know your application, you have to know your workload really well to figure out what the collection of queries that touch particular tables are. And um, shameless plug, Vivid Cortex is great for this because we capture every query that your server runs, and you can search for them by um, putting in a, a table name, for example, um, and then see every query, and you can rank them and sort them, and so forth. So you can find the most important queries uh, easily against your tables and figure out whether they have optimal indexes or not. If a covering index is used, you will see using index in the, the extra column in explain. Um, that's the just the, uh, the little sort of hint that gets dumped into that extra column at the end of explain. It um, translates, again, to an index-only query um, or whatever you call it in your database of choice. Using clustered indexes, very important. You should use them if possible. If your data has an important natural key, a primary key that naturally expresses um, something about the data, which is true in a lot of cases, um, you should co consider strongly consider using that, especially in NODB. Again, InnoDB is going to always store the table as a clustered table with a clustered index. If you don't give it one um, by creating a unique or primary key, then it will create a hidden one for you behind the scenes. And if you do something like create an auto increment column, or if your ROM creates an auto increment column for you, then you're potentially using a very poor key and ignoring a natural key that would be a very good fit, and very strong um, clustering effect for your data itself. So to give you an example, in Vivid Cortex's uh, time series data, we use a clustered index on the host, the metric, and the timestamp. That's, um, that's the natural primary key of each little bit of time series data that we have. And it also matches the way that we look up that data. So uh, creating something like an auto increment column for that table would be a performance disaster compared to using indexes that are clustered with the data. And this is particularly a common grievance that I see with Ruby on Rails applications where it wants everything to have an ID column. Number five is to think carefully about your column order. The first priority for column orders is to make sure that you don't disqualify an index from, uh, from optimizing your important queries with order buys, group buys, distincts, or multi-column where clauses um, using that leftmost prefix rule. If, you're, if there's not a strong preference um, for which index order, to, uh, which column order to use in the index to satisfy those kinds of queries, if there's just, for example, um, queries that look for column A and column B and column C, but it doesn't matter what order, maybe equalities on all of those columns, then you have your freedom of choice in which column you put first. And generally, to cluster the data together the most tightly, you probably want to put 
the most selective columns first. That is the columns that will narrow down the possible range of rows to sort amongst first in the index. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. Um, one is by looking at your data's natural distribution and see if you can find the cardinality of the columns. Um, there are potentially some gotchas here, and that's why this is not a hard and fast rule, because you may have, for example, one value that is um, present in lots and lots of rows, and everything else is sort of uniformly or, or in some kind of natural distribution. But you have some outlier where you have a really, really bad behavior. Um, so you do have to consider your the, the characteristics of your data. Um, maybe you have like the Justin Bieber problem where you have one user who has a lot more data than others. Um, maybe you have something like I've seen in a bunch of uh, forum software where the, the anonymous user is user ID zero, and so enormous chunks of the table become user ID zero. Whatever you have, um, you have to think about that and carefully. Um, but absent any of those kinds of things, good rule of thumb generally is that you want your most selective columns first in the index. Finally, the last rule, um, the last thing that I see people tripping up on is over-indexing. An index represents a separate set of data, potentially, if it's not a clustered index, that has to be kept in sync with the main data. And so that means that you have to multiply your writes. You have to update your data in multiple places. Um, means that you have to do a whole bunch of potential locking and other work to prevent inconsistencies. Um, so you want to avoid that the extra work. You want to get the most that you can out of your indexes and create as few as you can, which there's a, there's a judgment call to be made here. There's a balance between creating indexes to speed up your important queries and creating indexes for every possible scenario that mm, potentially wouldn't be used, or maybe some of those indexes could be used to serve multiple queries um, just fine. So you want to avoid duplicates. Uh, it is possible in MySQL to create plain old duplicate indexes. If you add an index to a table with the same columns over and over again, you will end up with duplicate indexes over and over again. Um, you also want to avoid indexes that are not necessarily completely duplicates, but may have a common prefix. So if you have a query that looks at column A, and you have a query that looks at column A and column B, because of the ability to use a prefix of the index, if you create an index on column A and then column B, both of those queries can actually use that index. And again, there's not a hard and fast rule here because you may end up with um, an index that has eight columns in it that serves a whole bunch of queries, but the most important query actually only accesses the first column. And so the index is much larger because it's got eight columns. And so you might be better off creating a, a single column index for that really important query and then an eight column index for all of the others that are less important. There would be some duplication there, some logical redundancy. But if the workload demands it, it might actually be the most efficient thing to do. And then finally, if you have indexes that are not used, um, and if you could prove that you're not using them, then you can drop them. And that can be a big uh, win, both in save, space savings and in IO and performance. We're going to toolkit as a couple of tools. Um, I think a couple of those are still not very well known. I wrote them. Um, when I was at Procona, one of them is called PT Index Usage, and that can help you analyze which indexes are being used, and other nifty things such as whether queries have multiple execution plans. Um, and there's a duplicate index checker tool that I think a lot of people probably know about that looks for indexes that are straight up duplicates of one another, looks for indexes that are um, you know, prefixes of one another and potentially redundant, and gives you uh, SQL that you can use to drop the indexes that you don't want. So that concludes. Um, we're just 15 minutes left in the hour, if you were planning to spend a whole hour. Um, but we certainly don't need to. I don't see any questions yet, uh, but I have plenty of time. So go ahead and tweet questions at me if you'd like to. Again, just tweet to Vivid Cortex, and I'll see them. And there's my contact information. And while I'm waiting for any questions to come in, I'll just hop through a couple of resources that you might find useful. Um, one of them is our query optimization ebook that we released recently. 
That's volume one of a series, and that's on server profiling uh, to find the most important queries in your server or servers. And that's the preliminary step for a lot of this type of index optimization work. Find out which queries are most important, and then make sure that they're using indexes and make sure that you um, um, potentially combine the indexes that they're using and so forth and so on, get the most benefit out of them. There's always high performance MySQL, which has an entire chapter on these types of, of topics. And I recently just checked out this morning um, Marcus Wienan's book, SQL Performance Explained, which is a shorter read than high performance MySQL and focuses really on, uh, I think the title is a little bit misleading. It's not really SQL performance, it's index performance. It's very, very index focused. But still a good read. Short and, and has a lot of useful information in it. Uh, a few more resources, and these are linked, so if you look at the slides, um, they'll be uh, clickable and you can navigate through to those link destinations. Bricona Toolkit, of course. MySQL Manual, of course. A book, this is a link to Amazon.com um, that I mentioned, Relational Database Index Design and the Optimizers. Goes into great depth on these things, gives you a, a ranking and scoring system um, on indexes and queries. Um, a link to the DZone article that I just wrote about storage engines and what's happening, you know, sort of trends in modern storage engines. Um, another ebook, the Guide to Building Database Driven Applications with Go, which is how to use Go's built in database SQL user interface. And then finally, our last resource that I'll mention is another upcoming webinar in April. April 28th, Owen Zanzal is going to talk about how we use Ansible. Um, we use Ansible for a, a lot of stuff here at Vivid Cortex. We use it very heavily. Um, we use it in combination with chat bots and the like, which Owen has talked about before, chat ops at Vivid Cortex. And there's a, um, a link you can register there. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I guess I will go ahead and wrap it up, and you can have 10 minutes to go get a cup of coffee before your next appointment. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it, and look forward to seeing you on a future webinar.